Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor David Tizard. Welcome to this latest lecture on a series covering Hallyu, the Korean wave. Recently, we've gone through quite a lot. We've looked at uh, the existentialism related in boy band videos such as BTS or, and whether that is influencing the latest uh, products that are coming out. We've also looked at external perspectives. I, I made you watch a BBC documentary uh, on how K-pop is viewed internationally. And, and that was quite a good one because it takes you from, uh, let's say, both the positive and the negative aspects. I was very pleased that some of you were saying it felt a little bit like a review. And that's good because that means that you're absorbing the knowledge. And when it's presented to you, it's reminding you what you've already learned and, and putting things in place and then building on that. So the review is not a bad thing because it helps gain retention. Uh, for this week, I'd like to take a slightly different approach, take a, a step away from K-pop because the Korean wave is obviously more than K-pop. And one of the big things is uh, movies, especially this year with the success of Giseng Chung. That seems a long time ago. It seems like a, a whole whole other world, a whole nother world ago when we used to be able to go outside when uh, Bong Joon-ho and the cast were uh, celebrating and talking about going out and partying and drinking and things like that. Obviously, such things can't really be done at the moment. Nevertheless, this week I, I would like to take a look at this thing called How You Would. It's not really that popular an expression, you know, Hollywood and How You, so How You Would. It's, it's like an extension what you get of Bollywood, the Indian film industry. Nevertheless, there's something to be said for uh, Korean cinema. I would like to start by having a look at some information uh, from this article. You can see it's called Hollywood Korea's Comparative Advantage in the Global Motion Picture Industry by Sebastian Mirodo. And you can find it pretty easily online by just searching these titles if you need it or of course you can message me and i will send you a copy uh, so this is the first material that i'd like us to have a look through um, this is all taken uh, from the article if the u.s movie industry is famously known as hollywood and its india counterpart as bollywood cnn reporters introduced in 2010 the expression hollywood to refer to the emerging popularity of the Korean motion picture industry. Now, this is, again, I would say rather interesting because as we learnt, Hallyu was a term that came from abroad. K-pop is also kind of a foreign term, a term that was invented abroad. It wasn't Koreans that first came up with the name K-pop and now for the movie industry as well this Hollywood again these names not the products or not the, the the things themselves but the names have foreign origins so from that it reflects external perspectives on the domestic Korean industries and there are two things that I would like to say about this industry industries uh, the first thing it doesn't really matter where the names come from does it I don't think so but one would be what would Koreans refer to these if not for these names so if K-pop if Hallyu or if Hollywood hadn't been uh, invented by people outside of Korea what then would Korean people refer to the Korean wave this this thing called K-pop and and the domestic movie industry what would it have then named them if not for those things and does the external naming, this is perhaps a more difficult question, does the external naming 
um, give extra authority. Now let me just try to explain this because perhaps many of you know the term of Sadejui uh, for the international students. Sadejui, something like that, I believe. It has a Wikipedia page. Um, the idea of Sadejui, the idea that something uh, looking up to the more powerful countries, uh, essentially. And there is, I'll be very careful with my words here, but I, I, I think a lot of observers, a lot of commentators would say that if something is reported about Korea in the international press, it has more power than if it's reported in domestic press. So if, for example, BTS are in the New York Times, wow, that's great if they're in the in the uh, Hangure or something like that, then it's not as interesting. There is this idea that if something is reported outside, then it's giving legitimacy, it's giving uh, authority to the Korean thing. So I just wonder if, if, if that comes into it at all in this part, because it does in other aspects of society. We've seen that uh, when Korean things are reported in the international press, it, it comes back with a lot more uh, prestige or authority for some Koreans. For some Koreans, you might be saying, no, David, that's rubbish. Absolutely. Um, but for some people, it is true. For some Koreans, if, if things are abroad, you have this sadeju. It's, it's a real thing for some people. So does that affect it at all? Uh, moving on from the names. There are several explanations for the success of Korean movies and Korean firms in the international movie industry, with the talent of Korean directors, actors and technicians certainly being a key factor worth considering. Scholars have also explored other cultural determinants, such as the popularity of Korean culture in East Asia and the successful blending of Korea's local culture with global entertainment. So the film's primary reason, if you want to use a quote, will be the talent. It's a very interesting thing here that this article points to the success here is based primarily on the talent or the skill, the the shilyok. It's a very interesting thing. And I think uh, a good comparison or good pieces might have a look at the way people report on K-pop and K-movies. Now, of course, we all have our own personal opinions, and that's absolutely fine. I just find it interesting that in this article, the the big reason for the success, the international success, is the talent. And that's not a word that people always immediately use with K-pop. They might say the sort of government sponsorship. Uh, they might say the, the mass production or choreography, but sort of innate talent. That's very different from sort of hard training. You know, you train every day to do this thing. And then, of course, not everybody could be a K-pop star. But if you kind of trained like that for a long time, it seems to be more about the training uh, and the, the than an innate skill or ability. So that's a very interesting thing. I, I would perhaps consider a good academic study if I was thinking if I had the time to do one, I think a good academic study would be, well, let's take how often the word talent or skill and the, the word practice and repeat come up when talking about movies and pop music. And of course, they're different. We're comparing a little bit apples and oranges, but in the way they're reported on, in the way that they're uh, discussed by people, does talent come up more in this one and sort of training and, and, and repetition in that one and, and why is that and is it genuine i think that would be an interesting uh, study before the korean wave there was already a cinema of quality and a substantial production of movies in the country what has changed over the years is the increasing globalization of the korean movie industry so again this is uh, an important point to make that before the korean wave there wasn't really k pop now of course it's not true but a lot of people will start any study of k-pop in uh sorry 1992 with sotaeji and nan and those kind of things but of course that's not that's just one point where we mark history uh, but a lot of articles do do that with k-pop 
with Korean cinema, though, it, it's very different. You'll find that uh, this year, Korean cinema, uh, or last year, sorry, uh, the president, President Moon, was talking about the 100 year anniversary. So, Korean cinema, if you want to be really weird, Korean cinema is older than Korea. Because if you take 1910 to 1945, it's the occupation, and then, oh, I can't write, 1945 to 1948 as the US military government, and then 1948 as the start of the Republic of Korea, when it officially gets its name, sort of it chooses its name, its, uh, its national symbols and such forth, when it becomes De Han Minguk, uh, that's 1948. But Korean cinema stretches back to 1919. So it's very interesting to see how long a history it has, uh, longer than the country itself. It's not something that makes logical sense, but it's true. And you've probably heard, I hope you've watched the Arirang interview with Darcy Parkett. Darcy, obviously, is a fantastic, has a fantastic knowledge of films. I've, I've met him a couple of times and interviewed him. He's a very charming and well-spoken and generous and kind, but mostly intelligent person. And you hear him talking about the, the history of films and some of the ones that he's liked over the year or so. Korean cinema was there before the Korean wave. It, it, it has a longer history. It has a longer lineage. Whereas sort of the Korean wave starts with K-pop or starts with the dramas around that early 90s, mid 90s. Korean cinema has been going a lot longer. Um, some statistics here, which I think is interesting. Again, all from the same article. According to the Korean Film Council, 494 Korean films were released in 2017. This places Korea in the top 10 countries that produce the most number of films annually, ranked 8th in 2015. Comparatively, it is quite behind India, Nigeria and United States, but in the same range as France, United Kingdom, and East Asia, it lags behind China and Japan. So, in the world, who produces the most films? Well, India is well out on top, nearly 2,000 films a year in 2015. After that, you get Nigeria, which has a sort of new fledgling film industry, uh, the United States, China, Japan, but then around here, France, United Kingdom, Republic of Korea, they're all producing nearly sort of uh, 500 movies, it says here. So, France, United Kingdom, Republic of Korea, their film industry is producing about the same, which is pretty good. However, the number of films produced does not accurately account for the economic importance of the movie industry within and across countries. For example, Nigeria is the second largest film producer in the world with about 1,000 movies produced annually. However, most Nigerian movies are completed in less than a month and with a budget between 25,000 and 70,000 US dollars. The same observation also holds true for India, where a high number of films are produced with, on average, low budgets. This statement is not a prejudgment regarding the quality of these countries' movies, but from an economic point of view, the turnover of each industry might be a better metric of comparison across countries. So, what it tells us there is, yes, India and yes, Nigeria produce the most films in the world, but many of their films are produced very, very cheaply. That doesn't mean they're bad films. It just means that the money spent, the money invested is far, far less. So they produce more, uh, but at lower, lower cost. So if you look at turnover per capita, so this here, figure two highlights the economic strength of the Korean movie in industry. With about $38 per capita of turnover, Korea has the fourth highest income in the global industry, only behind the US, the UK and France. It is also worth noting that Korea has a box office similar size, similar in size to the UK's and France's, about one and a half billion dollars, and produces a similar number of movies. Thus, the turnover of the Korean movie industry is quite impressive, especially when compared to Japan's, a country which enjoys a higher GDP per capita and more mature markets. So Japan has a bigger economy than South Korea, but the turnover per capita so how much the films produce in relation to 
how much they cost so you make the film how much does it produce how much are the results for it obviously looking at hollywood it's far above and beyond the uk you know it has things like bond and it things has things like harry potter and such forth france always has a strong uh, film industry you might have seen uh amelie and uh what else you know, lyon and such forth jean-luc besson movies but in this chart korea's fourth in the world that's quite impressive of course it's only economic but if you consider again if we just go back that south korea began in 1948 or its movie industry in 1919 to be the fourth in the world is a very very impressive thing especially consider in other countries so not a lot of countries make movies but korea does make movies and it, and it makes them to a certain degree according to the gbc income korea is ranked third in the global motion picture industry with an income share of six percent more importantly this share has doubled since 2005 highlights the rapid expansion of the Korean movie industry in the last decade. Only China has a higher growth rate during this period, and it ranked fourth in 2014. Japan's share is on the decline, so this is the world share. So how much do the films have of the market uh, in terms of income share? Well, in 2005, 2014, United States has almost half of the whole income from the movie industry in the world the world's movie industry nine percent goes to the united kingdom and in third korea gets six percent level with china uh, korea gets six percent of the world's global movie industry that's quite a big thing to be third in a table like that and, and this is 2014 so one might suggest that uh, with the, of course Avengers and all these movies will really boost that uh, and Star Wars but you wonder with the recent successes of Korean movies whether that's not still growing for me it makes sense because Korean movies are great the interesting thing is whether uh, Korean people are as aware of it or the Korean public are as aware of it as they are aware of the success of BTS or Blackpink are they aware how well Korea performs is the public recognition of Korean movie success this is just economically but in the international globe are they really aware of how well it does according to the statistics and the research and if they're not as aware of it is there a reason for that or it might be not a question. People say, yeah, Korean movies, we know they're the, the third best in the world or they're, they're here. They always do this. So if that's understood, then that's great. If it's not understood by the large percentage of the population, why is that? Is there a reason for that? The country, so the comparative advantage or the revealed comparative advantage. The country with the highest revealed comparative advantage. Uh, where's my pen not working? Sorry. This is here. Revealed comparative advantage. Yeah. Country with the highest revealed comparative advantage in the motion picture GVC is Korea. It is ahead of the US, implying that while the share of the US in the income generated by the motion picture industry is high, this share relative to the share of US income in other industries is not as high as its Korean counterpart. With a value of two, the US still displays a strong comparative advantage. But Korea has a higher one with a value above three. So compared to the rest of its industry, compared to the rest of its income, Korea's comparative advantage is in the movie industry, outstripping the United Kingdom, the United States and these other countries. So depending what statistics you use, South Korea can be sort of fourth in the world, first in the world, second, or it can be pretty high in this. The Korean motion picture industry is relatively concentrated, as shown by the market shares of the four main Korean companies that distribute movies in Korea. These companies are CJ E&M, Showbox, Lotte Entertainment, and Next Entertainment World. However, the landscape of Korean movie distributors is always changing through mergers 
foreign investment and the emergence of new players, thus preserving a reasonable level of competition in the market. Furthermore, foreign companies, particularly Hollywood studios, maintain significant market shares in terms of distribution, though this is mostly for foreign films. As conglomerates play an important role in the Korean economy, the Chebols, it is tempting to see how the Korean economic model is applied to the movie industry. However, concentration in the motion picture industry is not specific to Korea. Walt Disney Studios, founded in 1923, has gone through a series of mergers and acquisitions. The company now owns Pixar, Lucasfilm Limited, Marvel Studios, 21st Century Fox, with a market share estimated at 27% of the global movie industry. So, the market share for the distribution of movies in Korea by sales, 2012, 2017. In 2012, CJ E&M had 26.7. It had over a quarter. Uh, more recently, that's dropped down to 15. But you can see that four main companies dominate the domestic uh, market. Sony Pictures has had a huge drop. We have these mergers and acquisitions. But if we stay on the Korean one here, the point that it makes is, like the domestic or Korean economy, The, the movie industry is run by conglomerates. That's not saying this is good or bad, but the chebols. So there are, and, and like the mu uh, music industry that we've uh, looked at as well. Now, this is quite interesting that this would happen. It's not specific to Korea because in America you get Walt Disney Company is buying up all these other companies. So it does happen elsewhere. Korean conglomerates and chebels are a little bit different from Western multinational companies. A lot because there's sort of a family and sort of work, uh, what would you call it? Atmosphere, rules, Samsung and Apple, yes, they're the same, but there, there are differences. I'm not saying one is better or, or worse than the other but actually it was reported that Samsung might not uh, pass down all the shares or that the ownership the management I think it was the management to the children of course the shares are the important thing but maybe it's uh, developing so Korean companies in the movie industry just like the domestic Korean economy and just like the music industry they're run by four big companies called gatekeepers. Maybe this is what succeeds. Now, this is a really weird thing because we spend all our time, or people spend a lot of time advocating the free market, advocating democracy is obviously a political system, advocating capitalism. We don't want state-run economy. We want competition. Uh, we want a free economy. And we want sort of open market capitalism where competition and uh, this will push the cream to the top. South Korea's success has been based on the opposite of that. South Korea's success, well, a lot of it was based on sort of central planned economy. You had Park chung five-year plans. We'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. We won't let the companies compete with each other, but we'll direct certain companies and support certain companies. So it's not equal, but... It's more about what produces things. So maybe a lot of Korea's success is, is not always down to that. Obviously, the ideology plays a big thing because of Nambuk, uh, North-South Korean relations. You can't even say anything that gets you even close to socialism or communism here about sort of planned and centralized economies. But there is definitely elements of that at play. In Korea... The traditional chebols, such as Samsung, Daewoo and Hyundai, are only marginally involved in the movie industry. All three closed their movie divisions in the aftermath of the 1997 financial crisis. As a consequence, new companies have emerged that can be regarded as the chebols of the movie industry, all of which are the products of younger and more contemporary histories. For example, CJ ENM is the result of the merger between CJ Entertainment, Mnet Media and On Media. CJ Entertainment was created in 1995. 
Showbox was created in 1996 and belongs to a confectionery company. Lotte Entertainment is a subsidiary of the Japanese-Korean conglomerate Lotte Group and was created only in 2003. Next Entertainment World was created in 2008 by former president of Showbox. As owners of theatres, both the CJ and Lotte groups follow a strategy of vertical integration. This was also the case with Showbox when the Megabox theatres were still part of the Orion group. Mergers and acquisitions are still going on in the Korean media industry, and with the digital economy and the expansion of Korean movie companies outside Korea, the landscape is still open to change. Nonetheless, large vertically integrated companies are part of the Korean strategy for building a strong comparative advantage in the motion picture industry. So we have this idea of comparative advantage. Uh, if you're economically inclined, you'll, you'll have a look at Ricardo and Keynes's uh, theories on this. You also got this word here, which is vertical integration, which I think is a big part of Hallyu as well, or, or even K-pop, but not something we've really touched on. Now, vertical integration. Uh, there might be some economic majors out there that uh, perhaps know it or explain it a little bit better than me. It's been a long time since I've even thought about vertical integration, but you can have horizontal and vertical integration. Uh, now, in terms of vertical in integration, what it's saying here is that these companies, they have a role in the production of the films in how the films are made. So they, they produce the films, they invest money, they get the stars, uh, they, they pay for the, the locations and such forth. But then they're also involved in the showing of the movies because they own the cinemas because they own where the movies are shown so from the start of where the product is made with the investments and the money to the final thing where it's shown in the cinema in that chain vertically rather than horizontally in that vertical chain these companies are involved from let's say beginning to end or at that stage and at that stage that's a very interesting thing to have cinemas also owned by the companies that make the movies now you wonder if that might cause problems but it's it's very much a controlled process it's not like one company over here makes all the movies and and, and you make the cinemas no 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 no. we're gonna do everything and that's what you get like with the traditional chebos such as Hyundai or samsung because you can have a samsung phone and you can phone up for your Samsung health insurance from your Samsung apartment and then you can go onto your Samsung computer and go to a Samsung hospital you can do all that Samsung is both horizontal and vertical integrated into the economy a lot of a lot of companies dream of doing things like that but not a lot of companies do them and it's very particular it's not very particular in Korea. You see it in other countries as well, but it's a very big part of it. It's a big part of the domestic industry. It's also, you can see, a part of the movie industry. And we, it would be wrong to say if we look at these dates, oh yeah, that's just because of, oh, what would you call it? That's just because of the Pak Tong Yi and a long time ago and things like that. But the movie industry is these ones, the new ones, they're created generally after, or two of them were, two of them just before, around the aftermath of the 1997 financial crisis. So they're quite new, essentially. So it's old ideas, but still being played out in the modern world. And it's effective because Korea is, what, top, third in the world, depending. The third aspect of the international internationalization of Korean movies is in relation to the rise of the Korean wave as a global brand. The quality of Korean movies can explain their success abroad. So here, it's about quality. Remember earlier when I told you about talent? It wasn't about practice, it wasn't about training, it wasn't about re repetition. It's about quality and talent. However, the concept of brand means that the interest of viewers starts before assessing the quality of movies by looking at the movie's plot or reviews. 
In other words, a brand is the familiarity of non-Korean audiences with the style of Korean movies and which predisposes them to watch a movie because of this deemed Korean quality. Sorry about that, my baby's running in the room. I should do it when I do my live TV news interviews, then I'll like be like BBC Dad and have the kids running in and I can become popular. But um, I'm trying to remember where I was. Do, 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 do. The brand of Korea, so the talent, the quality, and people know about the quality of the Korean movie industry, as this, this article says here. So even before they've watched the movie, even before they look at the plot of reviews, if it's a Korean movie, they're going to like it. They're going to be predisposed. Uh, predispos they're going to have a predisposition. Young Sarah. They're going to have a predisposition to like that movie. Why are they going to like that movie? Because it's Korean and therefore it's going to have a quality. So it's like a positive prejudice it's like a positive tabel um, so that's a very interesting thing and, and this article says that that's what koreans have because of korean movies going abroad they have this global brand and there is a quality inherent in korean movies looking at this brand korea as previously mentioned, several authors regard the creation of cultural hybrids as the origin of the success of Korean movies in both a positive and negative way. Quite emblematic of this trend are the movie Shiri and Joint Security Area, two films released by CJ Entertainment in the late 1990s and regarded as the two earliest Korean blockbusters. They can be described as Hollywood blockbusters because of their budget, larger than any Korean movie before them, and the visual style of their action scenes, stunts and special effects. At the same time, the two movies are about the relationship between North and South Korea, with North Korean soldiers featuring in both plots, and share other cultural traits that make them identifiably Korean and not just generic Hollywood movies. So it's a cultural hybrid. It's a fusion style. It uses the Hollywood blockbuster style in terms of uh, production, in terms of money. It, I, I'm not sure if this is a correct thing to say or if it, it or if it's ethnocentric but even looking at these posters this one here it kind of looks like a Hollywood Transformers poster or I know that came afterwards but uh, but they look almost like this one particular Hollywood posters but it's a hybrid why is it a hybrid because it takes the the production and the values from the West and puts the content which here is the inter-Korean Nambukwonge from the East and so it makes this cultural hybrid it's not always just looking at Captain America saves the world and America is number one and the bad guys are all Chinese and it's got those values, but the content is different. The content allows different stories to be told. So it's a cultural hybrid. And again, some people see this as positive. Some people see this as negative. It's interesting that we probably go, if you go into the K-pop thing, you'll probably see this cultural hybrid thing again. That is it a combination of this and this? You might ask, however, I think rightly, why do high production values and blockbusters and things like that, why does that have to be deemed Western? Why can't other countries do that? Well, I think other countries can do that, and rightly they can. Absolutely. However, does it matter which country did it first? Well, if it did, well, we get that from Hollywood. We get Hollywood blockbusters. We get these kind of things. It was that... It's very different from, let's say, a French art house movie. If you watch a movie by Godard, who would make 10 films a year, and it was more about this aesthetic, artistic experience that didn't kind of make sense, rather than this big blockbuster. So different countries have different cultures. 
think we could probably accept that we're seeing that in the pandemic and different cultures produce different movie industries the american movie industry has produced this sort of blockbuster style now other countries adopt that style they don't adopt the the french art house film style because well some do but essentially it doesn't make money so it's taking that idea from the west putting it into the east and you get this cultural hybrid and that makes it popular let's have a look a little bit more at cultural hybridization however it is not enough to just imitate hollywood movies on one hand while we can say that korean films have followed the blockbuster model we can also say that these movies have we can say that these movies have also displayed genuine Korean traits. The strategy is therefore more comparable with the creation of a global brand. Now, again, this is something that we've looked at. It's interesting to see the parallels. So everything that you've learned and you've got about K-pop, it's like, does it work with the movies? Can I take that, those ideas and, and, and put it into this one as well? So when looking through your midterms, for example, uh, some of you are going through the Korean cultural features of uh, BTS videos and, and other pop group videos or idol videos. And you say, well, look, they're using the fans and they're using this and, uh, and they're using these symbols. So there are genuine Korean traits in them. The strategy is therefore more comparable with the creation of a global brand. A global brand has to cater to the tastes of consumers in different countries, which consequently causes it to lose some of its local characteristics. But it also needs to have its own identity to differentiate it from its competitors. Therefore, Korean movies should still be, to some extent, recognisably Korean. Cultural hybridization then makes perfect sense from a business perspective. The strategy is also complemented by a star system, which is not new in the movie industry. The star system refers to the promotion of Korean movies abroad through recognisable celebrities from earlier famous dramas or movies. It's a really interesting thing here. A global brand. So consider it as K-pop, consider it as Blackpink, consider it as uh, Ong Joon-ho's movies has to cater to the tastes of consumers in different countries, which causes it to lose some of its local characteristics. So it can't be too localized because then it won't appeal to the world. If it's really localized, it will appeal to that country, but not to the world. That's the first point. Does this make sense? Let's try to put this down. If it's too localized it won't appeal to other countries or cultures of course it might but it won't have broad mass appeal so if it's too localized it won't appeal however if it's completely if it's delocalized It has no identity. So if you completely take all the Koreans, well, if it's too Korean, if we talk too much about Soju and Han and Norebang and Myeongdong and Hamburg and Bulgogi, we put oh, it's all that, then people are going to watch that and go, oh, I don't really get what's going on. So if it's too localized, it doesn't work. But if you take out all the localized stuff and it's all just Big Macs, I know Big Macs sound american but they're kind of international right if it's all just well bread and milk and you take all the localized things out then it has no identity it can't stand out it doesn't have any competitive edge there's nothing that makes it different from anything else so what you get here is this line between localized and delocalized and it's getting that right and this is what we're calling here this cultural hybridization would be interesting to look at the cultural hybridization of Korean movies and Korean pop music. Is success or failure based on 
the effective cultural hybridization. If we look at Bong Joon-ho's Parasite, which we'll do in a minute, what about the cultural hybridization of that? Obviously, there's a lot that's Korean in there, but there's also a lot that's Western in there as well. So did he balance that right? Did he do that knowingly? Whether the strategy was deliberate or the result of trial and error is difficult to say. Over the years, Korean movies have explored many different topics and genres, and successful movies were not always considered typical blockbusters. While companies have pushed to make movies that attract the interests of larger and larger audiences, directors have also found within the constraints of the new Korean cinema ways to balance artistic quality with business imperatives. And that's Darcy's idea there. The Korean global brand in the movie industry also reflects the work of these directors. Here Darcy's point is that the directors have found artistic quality and business imperatives. We're balancing this. We, it needs to have skill and talent and be, it needs artist, artist quality. But on the other hand, it's got to make money and it's got to do something, otherwise the industry falls down. So we need to balance that. So how do, how do different Korean industries balance artistic quality and business imperatives? Does the movie industry do it different from the music industry, from the car industry, from the drama industry, from the sports industry and such forth? So that I think would also be an interesting thing to look at if you're curious about this. Here's a quote of cultural hybridization. The term is defined as the development of new cultural forms out of existing ones through a period of contact and interaction. It also includes cultural traditions, language and different mass communications from a society, mixing it into another society, creating a new culture from its current one. An example of cultural hybridization, I should say, probably is, I said a Big Mac earlier, bulgogi burger. A bulgogi burger in McDonald's is cultural hybridization because... You don't get a bulgogi burger in London or Paris or Rio or Jerusalem. You get a bulgogi burger in Korean McDonald's. So it, it's taking that international thing but giving it a local thing. So cultural hybridization, probably a great example, is a bulgogi burger. And of course, McDonald's does this in every country. You can get a fish and chips burger in England. It's not a fish and chips burger. Um... Let me just have a look at this and, th and then we'll close up. So uh, just to make sure we're a little bit more up to date, 11th of February 2020, it's by Laura Bicker, the BBC News uh, correspondent in South Korea. Uh, you can find it online very easily, or if you can't, I'll send it to you. What the Oscar win means for Korean cinema. Since the, and these are things take, taken from that article it looks like he's smoking a cigarette there, doesn't it, Bong Joon-ho? That was absolutely random. Since the Korean Peninsula was split at the end of World War II, there has been a deep-rooted insecurity here. A feeling, perhaps, people can only point to it on a map because it's next to a nuclear weapon-owning dictator in the North. The Oscars is affirmation that South Korea is a cultural powerhouse, and it now has a place in the history books. You might want to have a look at this idea. Uh, Laura Bicker, the BBC uh, reporter, says that there is a deep-rooted insecurity here. So this ties into that Sadejui element I was speaking about earlier. The idea that people don't feel confident or conscious or, or safe in the knowledge of their country's existence. And people only know about it because it's next to North Korea. And I would say a year ago, maybe two years ago, the most famous Korean in the world is was Kim Jong-un. Probably still is. I, I don't know. BTS are running in quite close, but that's BTS. That's that's a group. If you've got a picture of Kim Jong-un and any other Korean, Son Heung min maybe? RM? Don't they know? No. Kim Yoon, no. There is this problem that comes in here. Uh, according to this, you can agree or disagree with that as you like. Uh, this is what the BBC says about it, that there is a deep rooted insecurity here. But the point the article makes is that this Oscars win, this win by Bong Joon-ho's team, gets rid of this deep rooted insecurity. 
that this win makes South Korea a cultural powerhouse, not an economic. We know it's the miracle on the Han River. We know that South Korea has done amazing things economically uh, from being far poorer. Look at the photos of South Korea in the in the 19, uh, late 1950s, 1960s. It's incredible to see. I encourage you to do it, even Korean people. We know it's been an economic powerhouse, but now with this, it becomes a cultural powerhouse. And it is a cultural powerhouse that gives it a place in the history books. It's a very interesting thing. Bong Joon-ho's comedy thriller is the first non-English language film to win Best Picture. But to South Korea, these awards mean more than that. It is a cultural breakthrough. For a decade, this country has ploughed money into the so-called Korean wave or Hallyu, K-drama, K-pop and Korean cinema. The accolades from the Academy are proof that this cultural wave has come crashing down on Hollywood. It is a cultural breakthrough. It's not just money. It's not just, um, you know, you can look into things like Korea Gate. That's a real thing where uh, money is given to pro places in America to promote Korea because we have to be the real Korea. It's not economic. It's not political. It's not related to North Korea. South Korea's culture has smashed onto the world. It's come crashing down on Hollywood. Probably shouldn't use the... Uh, no, I won't. Sorry, thinking in my head about what I would say if I was not recording this lecture. How do you feel about this? Is that right? Does that signal the arrival of South Korean's culture? Was it a movie that did this? Did it arrive before? Did Sai's Gangnam Style do that? Was that the cultural breakthrough? Or was that just a pop song that went crazy for six months and then everyone was like, yeah, all right, great. We, we all do the dance and, and that's it, move on. Is this like that or is this different from that? Is this deeper than that? Is this bigger than that? How do you compare those? Was it different moments for you? So this article makes the argument that this is the cultural breakthrough. This is the time when the culture takes over. Korean cinema has been a force in its own right for more than 15 years. But it has taken time for it to get recognition within award bodies in the US and even a festival like Cannes. It took a long time before they finally awarded a Korean film with the Palme d'Or. In some ways, the seeds of success had been sown. South Korea is a nation of moviegoers and its film industry is the fifth biggest in the world in terms of box office sales. Uh, this is a point that I've made before, uh, whether you want to do critical or commercial success. I won't dwell on it uh, too much, but there is a difference between being the number one selling album in the world and being the number one award winning album in the world. Yes, these are still political and decisions are made by groups and uh, committees and such forth and there will be politics inside. There is a difference between commercial and critical success. The biggest commercial things are generally not really the best. Avengers doesn't win the best movie in the world award because it's Avengers. It's men in tights and good guys versus bad guys in America always wins uh, with some help from the minorities. But they're commercially the best. They're commercially on genuinely the generally the most successful, not critical. Bong joon -ho's use of storytelling is wildly innovative. Unpredictable and extremely entertaining, explains Professor Urshaves, who has studied Bong's work for 15 years. He's able to take audiences in directions few other filmmakers are able to do in a movie, let alone in a single scene. From moments of humour to horror in an instant without making it jarring. The film is about class warfare. It's about rich and poor. A universal theme which has made it possible for this South Korean story to resonate with audiences around the world have this fabulous quote here that was a big popular meme on the internet i tried to express a sentiment specific to the korean culture all the responses from different audience were pretty much the same essentially we all live in the same country called capitalism there is another korean figure behind parasite success co-producer Mackie lee who got the last word at the oscars 
after the audience protested when the lights went down. She is vice chair of the South Korean conglomerate CJ Group. Very little happens in TV or film in South Korea without her involvement. She is said to be a true film fanatic and has backed several of Bond's films. Her influence will have been considerable. It seems ironic that this social satire about class warfare came about with the help of one of South Korea's richest companies. But all of these factors combined appeared to have created a surprise hit. I think this is a very interesting line that this movie sort of ragging on, well, if you've seen Parasite, who are the parasites? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? It's a very ambiguous film and you could discuss which ways it goes with it. But definitely it's about class warfare. And in this film about class warfare, the conglomerates and the chebbles fund it to make it happen. That's a very ironic turn of events. President Moon Jae-in said his government would support Korean cinema as he started his cabinet meeting with a round of applause for Parasite. Parasite has moved the hearts of people around the world with the most uniquely Korean story. It reminds us how touching and powerful a movie can be. This year, the Korean Film Council has allocated 100 billion won for film development. That's a 32% increase on last year. This photo is very controversial on the internet uh, with the, the Bosu Dangs, the conservatives, going crazy that these people were having fun and laughing during uh, times of pandemic. Uh, to the end. But building on this success won't be easy, says film critic Ha Sang Te. To create the next Bong Joon-ho will be a long-term project for the Korean film industry. Director Bong Joon-ho is unique. I think now the government, the industry and big conglomerates need to all work together to promote diverse creators and their unique perspectives. Professor Bershevays agrees. The younger generation don't have the same kind of opportunities their predecessors had as studios grow more powerful. That being said, Korean cinema is in a very strong position going forward and the infrastructure is there to find further success. This is what you get with Weber. This is what you get with modernization and bureaucratization. As the studios, as these conglomerates, as they get bigger, as they get more powerful, as they get more focused on capital, it's going to be harder for people like Bong Joon-ho, harder for auteurs, harder for people who have their own singular vision. That's really bad writing. I'm going to be able to read that. Auteurs. Like Tarantino, Bong Joon-ho. As modernization and bureaucratization comes into the studios, as they get bigger, it's going to be harder for individuals to have the same opportunities just to do what they want. Instead of being able to do what they want, they have to be micromanaged and everything has to be done by decision. And that's what the film professor Bershevay says here about Korean. And here we need diverse creators and unique perspectives. So how do these problems, how do these necessities compare to the Korean film industry? Um, so there's a lot I've gone through in this. Maybe you'll have some ideas. Certain things interest you. Certain things don't. I've raised, I think, some some questions in class. We would we would discuss some of these, put them together. We would also look at uh, Korean movies. Which ones are worth watching? Which ones aren't, etc. So uh, please leave some comments in the discussion page. Uh, I do read them all. It's annoying that on the Solyode page, once the discussion finishes. I then can't add any more discussion. It sort of closes it off, but that's just the system. It's not like that on the other systems. Um, nevertheless, I do go through and I do read them, and I enjoyed your comments last week. Um, that gives me an idea of what is effective, what's not. I know you like the videos, um, so I'm trying to think of ways to do that. I know there's been talk about doing Zoom classes. Um, I would like to do Zoom, and I know many of you want to speak English and you want to have interaction uh, with more than 30 students, I'm, I'm not sure how it will work, whether there will be genuine interaction. That's why I try to offer uh, sangdams and things like that. Please remember that I'm always available uh, if you need me. And make sure you do your comment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and 